So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the last lecture. Uh, we still have one minute, but uh, I think I'm going to start and start slowly, um, allowing people to still come in. Um, so, uh, I'm not going to discuss the finals. Don't ask me about the final. A few people are still uh, working on the final and they're prob probably not here. Um, uh, I want to mention just a few words about homework seven. Uh, I apologize for the snafu. Uh, my intention was to not uh, not uh, have any teaming uh, on this homework, and someone point, pointed this, this out to me. But um, we forgot to remove this from the project, from the homework description. So if you teamed up, okay, just submit it twice. Uh, if you didn't, uh, if if you're still working and you teamed up, please try to continue as much as possible without uh, um, without partnering. Uh, we want to have a separate submission from of this homework from each of you. Uh, and somebody asked me uh, for an extension, and that's fine. We can have an extension until tomorrow morning. Uh, don't spend your night uh, on this homework. I don't think it's worth. Um, but if you need some more time, uh, Jessica will open up. Um, we'll, we'll, ma we'll make sure that we accept uh, we accept homework until tomorrow morning at seven o'clock. I think that's what we. Um, that that was the latest on the deadline. <clears throat> so that's uh, about uh, the last uh, homework. Um, and um, other than that, today we have uh, a lame duck lecture. Uh, but I want to show you two very cute topics, and I, I, I well, I'm going to try my best to make it worthwhile for you to come here, uh, come coming here. Uh, so these are topics that are in data management, and they are not about performance. <laughs> So far, most of our discussion was about uh, this data independence and the idea that we can still achieve a performance while keeping this uh, um, phys um, independence from the physical layout uh, uh, vision. Uh, but data management is actually a much richer uh, area, much richer topic. And what I want to, to briefly show you today are two uh, pretty hot topics in data management. Uh, I'm sure you heard about the second one, data privacy. That's very hot, but it's also unsolvable in some sense. But the other one is getting very, very important. Uh, and the abstraction that um, to think about data provenance, they became pretty clear in the last few years um, in the research community. And they are not available yet in any book, or as far as I know, or in any product. So this is what I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about data provenance. It is also called data lineage or data pedigree. Uh, and the slides that I have, they are, they're coming from Val Tannen's keynote at um, a conference last spring, EDBT. Uh, this is European Database and Technology Conference. So, pro so these are his slides, essentially. It's a, it's a subset of his slides. Um, so what is provenance? Uh, here is a dictionary, is dictionary definition. The fact of coming from some particular source or quarter, uh, this is a type of, I forgot what is this, uh, origin or, deri or derivation. That is the, the definition in the dictionary. What we want to do essentially is that we want to keep track of where the data comes from. This is uh, the main motivation in, in, for the researchers, it comes from scientific data management. Uh, the scientists, they start from some raw experiments, then they process that somehow, then they run, run some tools on the process data, they integrate it with other data, and then they run more processing, more aggregation. And that, now they want to, to keep track of, um, for example, they, they change one of their basic uh, experiments. So now the question is, which of the derived data is affected? Or, um, or conversely, you, you don't trust uh, one of the results in your, one of your derived data. The question is, which of the input data contributed? So that is the, um, the, the purpose of data provenance. All we want is some notation, some kind of formalism that allows us to express how the data was, how the data got there, how it was derived. So some uh, two slides about the terminology. So should we call it data provenance, or data lineage, or data pedigree? And you'll hear all three terms used in um, uh, used today for data provenance. 
uh, but this is a cute um, information to keep in mind is that pedigree is used for dogs, right? And lineage is used for kings and royalties. Uh, and provenance is for art. So in data, let's be artsy and call it provenance. But I, I should warn you that I often call it lineage. Uh, I, I hear, re rarely hear the term pedigree, uh, but I think it's used in industry. Um, but in research, it's lineage between, between lineage and provenance. We are with the arts and the kings, not with the dogs. Uh, so what kind of data transformations uh, would be nice to uh, carry the provenance with them? Well, um, in general, any data transformation it would be nice if we could automatically carry with it uh, the, the provenance of the underlying data. Uh, but right now, we only have the technology for queries and views for, um, for these two. Uh, for the rest, um, it's, it's a black magic art. Uh, it's a matter of um, trying to keep track of some information about how the data was processed, but you won't be able to, to store the entire tool that, that um, process your data. In the case of queries, uh, it's kind of more under control, and this is a case that we need to understand first. When we um, process data, we transform it, we integrate it, we query it, we join it, we select it, we project it. Uh, and now we have a tuple in the result. We should be able to answer the question, how was this tuple derived? Where did it come from? Okay, so let's do the, the beautiful mass that came with it. Uh, the mass that you need to keep track of provenance is called semi-rings. So how many people have, have heard of semi-rings? Not that many, I guess. How many people have heard of rings? What is a ring? Almost everyone. It's a, a, ma it's a mathematical definition. And semi-rings is half of it. Okay, so I'll show you what, what it is. So let's start with a simple example. Let's suppose all I do is to create a view where um, I join a table R with a table S on some join condition. And now this tuple here, the tuple ABC, joins with the tuple DBE because a join condition decided to join them. And here is my output. And I want to, to keep track in my, provenance, um, in my provenance data. I want to keep track of the fact that this tuple came from, from these two tuples, from P and R. So I'm going to uh, use this notation, P dot R which just says uh, that um, it, to, to derive this output, the ABCDE, um, we, we made joint use of both P and R. Okay? Uh, think of it like a, like, a, like a record that contains a pointer both to P and another pointer to R. But it's a record with its side information that says these two were jointly used when we, when we derive the topic. Okay, let's see something else. Let's see uh, a union. So let's suppose um, um, let's suppose we union R and S, and we do this using duplicate elimination. So it's a union. It's not a union or. It's union with with distinct. So now uh, both R and S contains the top the, the tuple ABC. It was called P. Uh, in R, it's called R in, in S. Uh, but there's only one copy in the answer. So what is now the provenance of this tuple? Well, we, we need to keep track of the fact that it could come either from R or it come from, can come from S. And uh, again, we, we have like two pointers uh, where we keep a pointer to P and pointer to R. To R. Uh, but we need the side information that tells us this is an alternative use of the data. We, either, we, we can either have P or we can have R, and any of them is enough to produce a tuple ABC. Okay? So, so far, we have seen two operations. It's the joint use and the alternative use of the data. Let's see an, another one. Suppose we do a duplicate elimination which is a, like a standard projection. So now um, we only retain the AB attributes, 
and as as a, as a consequence, uh, all these three tuples they get they get uh, combined into a single A B in the output. Okay, this is another another instance of the alternative information. Now we see here um, that uh, this this tuple has a provenance which is B, alternatively R, alternatively S. So that's a notation that we need. Okay. So here is a complicated example. So this example is, um, what does it do? Well, it projects R and then on AC, then it projects on BC, then it projects, then it, jo it joins them, then it projects on AB, projects on BC, joins these, uh, unions them, uh, and then projects the result on AC, and finally does a selection. So we don't have to go through the details, and actually they're missing from the slides, but you can work them out. I know they, they work correctly because I, I read the paper that uh, has this example. Uh, and what you get in the result, as you know, <coughs> it's, it's a table with attributes A and C. Here are my A and C. Uh, and here are the tuples that participate. And here are the expressions, uh, the provenance expressions that annotate uh, this, this table. OK, so let me erase everything so we can go over, uh, over them slowly. Um, so obviously, there is, you, see, you can see here joint, which means we made joint use of uh, P and P. Uh, here is another joint. Here we made joint use of R and P. You can see instances of uh, of plus, which means alternative use of tuples. Uh, you can also see instances of zero. What does a zero mean? Where does a zero come from? Any hints? We didn't discuss zero so before. Look at the last operation in, in this complicated plan. You see it? <clears throat> what is the last the last operator? Selection. It's a selection on the, uh, the attribute C equals E. Now the first tuple does it have does it satisfy the selection? No. So the, so. <coughs> <coughs> so because of that, we put a zero. The next step will satisfy the selection. So because of that, we put, we put a 1. So that's how we get the 0 and 1. This is <coughs> for the final selection. OK. So let's see what we have seen so far. So um, we have this, this mysterious space of annotations. This is going to be our, um, um, our provenance annotations. Um, now we have relations where every tuple is annotated with something in this K, in this uh, space K, which is, which is a, the its provenance annotation. Now K is is like a mathematical object. It has some structure, some interesting uh, properties, and uh, not properties but operations. There is a dot, <coughs> which means um, um, joint use which means, uh, which intuitively says I need both, both things uh, in order to get my stuff. And there is plus, which means alternative use. It's like, uh, like for union. You can, I can either have the left thing or the right thing, uh, and any of them is fine for, uh, for my tuple. Uh, and in addition, we assume that K contains two special annotations, the 0 and the 1. Uh, let me see if they have better explanations. Uh, yeah, up, uh, 0 means uh, go away. It's like a, um, it's, it's a tuple that's not here. It's like the provenance of something that you shouldn't have. It's um, the, the throw away provenance. Uh, and 1 is um, the, the opposite. It's like saying, yeah, I'm happy with this. Uh, I'm, I have it. In sense, in there, there are no, no, nothing to block me from having this, uh, this tuple. 
So now we have a mathematical object. And this is why it's so elegant. Uh, we, we, we started from, a very, from writing down some very natural provenance expressions. And it turns out that this space that we need is essentially a mathematical object. Uh, it is a, a set K with two operations, plus and times, and with two special elements called 0 and 1. Do you remember from mathematics any um, algebraic structures that have a plus, a times, a 0, and a 1? Sorry? Arithmetic. Arithmetic, yeah, the, 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 sure, the, the, the um, um, natural numbers, right? Absolutely. But uh, missing. What about modular arithmetic? Same thing. If you take all the numbers modulo 7, uh, there are only 7 of them, 0, 1, 2, up to 6. Uh, you also have plus, you have times, uh, you have a 0, and you have a 1. Uh, in general, if you have any such set that has a plus, a times, a zero, and a one, with some properties, then it's called a ring, or it's called a field, if it has some additional properties. These are algebraic structures that have been defined in mathematics. And, and I'll, I'll show you in a, in a bit how we get there. Now, <clears throat> here is why we need algebraic structures on, this, uh, on, the, on the provenance expressions. Remember that uh, the, the, the queries that we write satisfy certain algebraic laws. Uh, we can't forget those laws. We can't ignore them. We must be prepared to, uh, to take ex uh, expressions that represent the same query because they, they are equivalent under these algebraic laws. And the reason why we need to do this is because, well, all, all the optimizers, they, um, they feel free to use these algebraic laws to optimize. So what are these laws? <coughs> uh, well, one thing is a union is asso associative and commutative. And we know that, right? You, you had to study the fact that union is associative and commutative. Joints are associative and commutative, and they're distributed over union. Right? It's one of the law in, in one of the slides that we had. Um, uh, and, and more stuff holds. But, but uh, interestingly, optimizers, they, they rarely use it's actually, they never use. They never use these laws, although they hold. And why, do they, why don't they use these laws? It is written on the slide, right? Bec because these laws, they hold over set semantics, but they don't hold over back semantics. So opti optimizer, they, uh, they, 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 for them, the algebra is under, under back semantics. So therefore, they don't use laws uh, that only hold for, for set semantics. Okay, so now here is a mental experiment that uh, you need to go through. Imagine two plants that are equivalent under this law. So let me write them something like this. <coughs> the typical thing. R join uh, ST. This is equivalent to um, R join, join of S and T. Now, if you compute the provenance of a tuple on the left, you'll get an expression which is of this kind. It's like you, you, you must use both A and B, and then you must use C. The same tuple on the right will have a provenance which is more like A, a, uh, a joint with BC. And of course, we want these two provenance expressions to be the same. We insist that they be equal because uh, they, we, we, we don't make any distinction between these two plans, so we better not make any distinction between these two provenance expressions. So it turns out that um, if, if you add to this algebraic structure exactly the laws that you need in order to ensure that, um, the, um, that, that queries that have the same semantics also have the same provenance expressions, then you get out of this a, commuta a commutative semi-ring. And I'll show you on the next slide, I hope it's on the next slide, what a commutative semi-ring is. Uh, and, and as a consequence, uh, the, 
the, um, the relations that you uh, need to manipulate uh, in order to, to keep track of provenance are relations annotated from a commutative semi-ring. Very interesting. So let me show you what a commutative semi-ring is. And this is something you might remember from algebra. So K is, of course, the set of all annotations that we are willing to accept. Think about these expressions that build up as we compute provenance. <coughs> uh, plus is an operation and that uh, we allow in these annotations, the um, alternative use. It must be associative, commutative, and zero is its identity. Remember, zero meant no provenance at all. I don't have this stuff. You, you can't have this stuff. Uh, and it has to be the identity for the, the plus. Times must be associative. Um, uh, and, and we must have one as identity. And moreover, times must distribute over plus. And this is because joint distributes over union. Uh, and moreover, you must have this law. So this is called a semi-ring. And uh, it is not a ring. In a ring, uh, plus has an inverse element. It's, it's all, always, have an, always ha has an inverse. And times does not have an inverse. If times had also has an inverse, then it's not called a ring. It's called a field. Uh, and this, my mathematics, mathematics there in algebra, they're very concerned about the distinction between a ring when you, you are not, don't have necessarily an inverse for times and the field where you do have an inverse. And they have completely different properties. Uh, now, a semi-ring is one in which not even plus is required to have an inverse. Now, in addition, we want times to be commutative because if you join R and S, the same as joining S and R and all optimizers uh, they will happily switch the order, and therefore we want uh, R joint T to be the same as T joint R. So that's a, that's a semi-ring, and this is semi-ring provenance. If we have such a semi-ring, and I'll give you examples of very interesting semi-rings, then, um, then, um, um, then you can write sem provenance expressions and with, uh, depending on what semi-ring you choose, you can keep track of provenance at various uh, levels of granularity. Okay, so now let's, let, let me show you what, what's really great about these, these provenance expressions. Um, let me see a little bit what's here, uh, what is here. Yeah, so look at these expressions here. I want to simplify them. So for one, one thing, how, how would you simplify this expression here? Well, if it's a semi-ring, then everything times zero is zero. So this goes away. It's, I mean, it's zero. This is equal to zero. And if it is zero, we can actually drop that tuple from the relation. Right? There is no provenance. How would you simplify this expression? In, in any semi-ring, if you multiply by one, it gets the same element. So this is T times R. This is zero, of course. Uh, now, th this is more interesting here. R times R. We can't simplify it, but uh, you can write it a uh, more clever way. How can you write it? R squared. R squared. Yeah, it's a standard notation for when we multiply something with itself. Um, but here we get R squared, squared again. So how, what's the standard notation for writing uh, when you have two, th th the same value added twice? How do, you, how do you usually write it? You write it like this. It doesn't necessarily mean that two is an object in your, in your algebraic structure, but this is how you, you, you write it just as, as an abbreviation. So therefore, these provenance expressions, they look like this. So um, we had, um, let, let's backtrack and see wh where we are. We had a complicated query that took just this table R and produced an output. And uh, it was a very complicated query. Uh, but when, if we carefully computed the provenance of every tuple in the output, this is what we get, these three expressions. 
So they look like, you know, like polynomials, like something you, you studied in, in college. Uh, but I'm going to show you to, uh, to you now that they have a very, very interesting uh, semantics in terms of provenance. But let me see uh, where does this come. Yeah, it comes right here. So let me let me erase and ask you how to read this. How you, would you read this? How would you describe this in English? The provenance of AE is PR. How was AE derived? From P and R. From P and R. And both had to be present in order for AE to be uh, in the output. Okay, this is much more interesting. How was this derived? How do we say this in English? How many choices are there? Two, right? It, it kind of depends how you count. Actually, there are three choices. There are three different ways to derive it because uh, there is R square, R square, and RS. Uh, one of them, one of the three choices, used what what tuples? R and S, right? So you used R and S and produced P. One of the other two choices, what did, what did it do? It used R, but it used it twice, it, in two different places in the query. It used R twice. And this is how we derive it. Very interesting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is how you read the provenance, um, the, the provenance semi-ring expressions. They tell you a lot of detail about how the tuple was derived, and you can use this detail for, for further processing. So let me um, let me show you some examples. So this this says in English what we discussed. <coughs> So at, at, at Penn, uh, where this re research work was done, uh, these semi-ring expressions were implemented in, in, a, in a, a research prototype uh, called Orchestra. And the first thing they did, I mean, not, not the first thing they did, but one of the things they did, they did uh, uh, deletion propagation, up update propagation. So here is the thing. Um, you have computed Q, and you stored it. Uh, and in an orchestra is stored on a different server, so it's a distributed system. And now the original source says, I want to delete this tuple. What should I do to the output? I don't want to recompute the query. How can I uh, quick, how can I cleverly update my output? What should I do? Exactly. You read all of them, that, but actually in a, in a slightly different way. You, you don't delete, you, you set R to zero. Remember the zero in our semi-ring? That's allowed. You can always, um, zero is a, is a valid element in the semi-ring. Set R to zero and see what happens. What happens to the first one? Zero. The second one? Zero. And the third one? Two S squared. So the first two disappear. And the second one still stays around, and you also know it's its new expression. So if if anything happens to to the previous one, then then it disappears. Um, and I think the other slides they show this. Yeah. So this is this is what they say. Set R to zero, and then um, this is what we get. And this is what we consolidate. Okay, let me sem show something else at school. So this was um, essentially set semantics, right? So uh, every tuple in R occurs only once, and every tuple in uh, uh, in, in, in Q is only occurs once. But now I'm going to change my mind, and I'm going to say uh, R becomes a back semantics. So the first tuple will occur three times, the second tuple occurs twice, and the third tuple occurs four times. Okay? So as a consequence, the tuples in Q will also be duplicated. Uh, how many times do I get AE? Six times. 
because it's, it's uh, 3 times 4, right? P is 3, and R is 2. C is 3, three times 2, it's 6 times. And how many times do I get DE? Uh, 2 times 4, which is 8, plus RS, which is 8 again, so 16 times. So you get the set semantic, the back semantics for free from these annotations. They carry, uh, they, um, they, they, they allow you to recover the back semantics. I found this quite cool. Right, so, so you, you um, imagine annotating these topics as they move around, and then you can use these annotations in lots of interesting ways. You, could, you, you can use them for uh, update propagation, you can use them to, to uh, uh, switch from, back, from set semantics to back semantics. Uh, and I will show you other, other usages um, um, in a bit. OK. So what, are, what interesting semi-rings are there? So far, we just use these annotations, these, these, these funny symbols. Uh, but there are concrete sets that you, you might recognize, and somebody said arithmetic, right? Arithmetic is, is, a con is an instance of, uh, uh, of a semi-ring. Um, and they give us different uh, information about, um, <coughs> about the provenance. So what happens if, if, we, if, if we replace, go, let's go back here, and imagine replacing all these symbols with numbers, as, as we did before. So now instead of, of this, we get a number, right? Then, then the semi-ring is this. The natural numbers, where plus means just addition. When you have alternative, it's like counting. Uh, you just add, add them up. Uh, and times is multiplication. If, if you have a joint use, and uh, one, uh, the left one is used two t twice, and this right one comes with three copies, then the joint use can have six different combinations. So one particular semi-ring is that we can use um, uh, we, we can use <coughs> um, uh, natural numbers, and then we can just get the back semantics. Of course, if, if you replace those expressions with numbers, then we lose something. Yeah, they are, we don't trace the provenance as we intended to. But the point is that the same abstraction, namely that of a semi-ring, uh, explains to us both the, uh, the provenance uh, and the back semantics. It also explains the set semantics. If we just want the plain vanilla set semantics, well, we, d we didn't need semi-rings to start with, but if you insist on using a semi-ring, the semi-ring to use is a, is a boolean. So uh, it has two values, true and false, which is one and zero. Uh, and often, sometimes they are denoted top and bottom. Uh, and what is, what is, uh, yeah, these are switched, now I realize. What is plus in this semi ring? What, sh what should it be? It's or. So this is my plus. They are switched. And times is and. Okay, there are other interesting um, things. This is, this is the most interesting thing, but maybe, maybe we'll come back after. No, let's, let's discuss it right now. Uh, and actually, I think I have some animation for this. Um, here is an interesting application. Uh, think about uh, access control levels. So now you're designing a database for the military. And every single record uh, has an annotation which can be uh, public. It can be um, classified, secret, and top secret. This is what those numbers, what, what those symbols represent. Public, uh, top secret, and in the middle there is uh, classified and secret. Okay. And um, as you process your queries, you would like to uh, keep keep track of the um, of, of the secrecy of the data that you're processing. So 
So for example, what happens if you uh, have to compute a join and one of the tuples is, is public and the other one is secret? So you, you join a public tuple with a secret tuple. You get a tuple which is how? Which is secret. Uh, what hap uh, so, so therefore, therefore our times is what operation in this in this ordered set? If I take two elements, public like public and secret, and I do the joint use, what is the result? The maximum. Very interesting. So still a semi ring, right? The max. Now, what about um, uh, what about alternative? So the, the user asks a query. Uh, it's a union of two tables, and uh, uh, I get the same tuple in both tables. But in one table, it's 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 uh, secret, and the other table is public. How should the answer be? Cle clearly public, right? Because if, if you found it public in one table, then well, it's, it means it's, it's available. So the um, the the plus if the if times was max, the plus is min. Uh, so, so that means that if you annotate, if you annotate your tables uh, with this semi-ring, which is the access control semi-ring, then it means that you, the results of your queries they give you for free the annotations of the classification level for the secrecy of the output. And it's the same abstraction. You don't need, don't need to learn something new. It's the same semi-ring abstraction. It's very, very, very nice. So, um, what are what are Zero and one in this semi ring. That's very interesting. What is zero? No access at all. Yeah, it's so secret that nobody can see it. It's no answer at all. So this means that if you're joining, if you're joining something that's top secret with something that's zero, it's zero, right? It's, it's no, no such, no such thing, right? Uh, what is one? If you join something that's one with some with something else, then the one doesn't matter. The, 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 it's just it's just a something else. So that's a public. So one is public. Um, you can you can play the same game uh, in in this semi ring. Uh, which takes um, numbers as as um, levels of of, um, of of confidence of trust. So here, uh, bigger means uh, you trust more that that information. And and then the operation would be um, min. I think stands for. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Yeah, min is plus, and plus is times. So it means that uh, no, sorry, it's, it's not. It's distrust. It's how much your, or cost. Our oh, cost is, be is best. This is the cost of the data. Okay. So imagine, imagine now a setting in which uh, every item in the database costs some money. You want an answer from a database. You have to pay for all the items that your query touches. So now, if you do a join, what what is the cost of the join tuple? the sum. But if you do a union, uh, one tuple costs so much, the other tuple costs so much. What's the cost? Well, I, I wouldn't pay more than, and we would pay for the smallest, for the small, minimum one. So this is why uh, plus represents the cost of join, and min represents the cost of alter, al alternation, of alternative, either for duplicate elimination or for um, union. Very interesting, uh, and there are other examples that people have have used. In, in uh, this is uh, very exciting for researchers, but maybe we should we should skip skip those examples. Um, so, I wonder how deep I should go into this. But maybe maybe it's worthwhile to consider. Um, let me tell you why this was so confusing. Uh, so, research into prob into data provenance uh, started in the early nineties, uh, and it was quite active in the late 90s, early 2000s, 
uh, and people were very, very confused. This is a very um, uh, in highly cited piece of work by uh, Widom, who is a professor at, um, uh, at Stanford. And they wanted to define, to understand provenance in data warehouses. Uh, they didn't uh, come up with the semi ring idea. This is a re very recent development. Uh, but they, they said, look, um, if you if you compute uh, if you compute that complicated query and you get uh, the answer DE, then they would annotate this uh, with the tuples that you you ever used uh, to, to get that, that result. Uh, so you uh, remember DE had a complicated expression that involved R and S. So in in uh, in this early model of of lineage, they called it lineage. Um, the lineage was just a set RS. Okay. So um, so what is uh, what does alternative what, what does join mean here? If 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 this tuple with this tuple was obtained by touching several tuples. And this, this uh, uh, tuple was obtained by touching several tuples. Now when I join them, which tuples did I touch? The union. So join is just union. What about uh, true union, alternative? So I could uh, either use this tuple or I could use this tuple. So which of the base tuples did I touch? Also the union. I don't know why there is a star. Is there a wrinkle here? No, this is this is a semi ring. So uh, th this semi ring, uh, the plus, and I wonder why is there a star? No, there is there is no no reason. So the plus and the times are the same operation. They are kind of they, they lose the distinction between alternation and uh, between joint use and alternative use. And the the, the, new, the neutral elements are the same. Okay, so this was one. So then, uh, uh, actually not long time after that, um, Peter Bunemann and, um, uh, and others, they said, let's keep, let's keep track of more, more detailed information. And they said, look, um, this tuple DE, actually, don't tell me that it's, you, you just touched R and S, but tell me what is the minimum um, uh, set of witnesses, what, what, no, what are the set of witnesses that produced DNT? And if you remember, you could produce it by just taking R or by, by taking R and S. So for them, and this was called Y provenance, um, the, the Y provenance was a set of sets. Now in this set of sets, um, the joint uh, meant, meant like this, in one, so what is, what is joint use? I, I could, for one of them, I can use R or RS. And now I want to join this with another tuple which had uh, RT, uh, ST. No, S, S, SU. Let me do it this way. So then, what are the alternatives for the joint tuple? What kind of, of set of witnesses can contribute to the joint tuple? Well, for the tuple on the left, you could start, for instance, for, from this, from R. Tuple on the right, you could start from RT. So you union these two, and you get RT. Then you move on to R and SU. That's, a, that's another combination. And you union them, you get RSU, and so on. And you take all four. Uh, unions of sets. So uh, that, this operation doesn't have a good name, but this symbol is good enough for it. So this says take two sets of sets and uh, uh, return the set of all pairs of unions. So the union is, is pushed inside. Um, so the, uh, the, the neutral element for this join is a set consisting of CMT set. And the neutral element for union is the set consist uh, the empty set, different things. Okay, so let me move on. 
Uh, then, um, also, also Bunemann, this was actually in the same paper, they also looked at a different kind of provenance that uh, was called Y provenance, and they said, look, if, uh, if for this tuple you had the witness just R, and then a separate witness RS, uh, don't consider RS, because R by itself is sufficient to return to construct this tuple. So this was a, the, the set of minimal witnesses, which corresponds to another semi-ring. We shouldn't go over it. It's actually exactly the semi-ring of Boolean expressions. Um, and, and then there were others that, um, uh, in, in TRIO, also the, the group by, by Jennifer Widom, um, they, they had a, yet another refinement of a semi-ring. And if you're confused by now, I'll show you, I'll show you a nice picture where everything fits together. And the nice picture is right here. So this is, um, these are all the semi-rings that make sense. Let me put it this way. And at the, at the top, these are the polynomial expressions. N of x means uh, polynomials uh, with integer coefficients over some variables, and x means not just one variable, but multiple variables. Uh, so what, is, what kind of annotations are you allowed to have if this is your, your semi-ring? Well, you can have stuff like this. 2 times r squared s plus 3 times r s cubed. Yep. In which r, s are the variables. They represent uh, pointers to tuples in the input. And then you can have arbitrary annotations with, with polynomials over those variables. OK, so let's see what, what are the other uh, pieces of information. Actually, this is much better. So uh, here, here they are. <coughs> so at the top, we have just polynomials. Uh, what you can do with these polynomials, and this is really cute, you could, you could drop the coefficients. So, this says I can use x squared y twice um, in two different ways. You can forget it. Uh, and this gives you something else, which are, which are uh, polynomials over, uh, over booleans for, for some reason. Or you can, you can drop the exponents. You can say, uh, why should I care that uh, I used y twice? You can all, all retain just um, uh, the fact that y is used once, but keep track of the five alternatives. So this is another, another semi-ring. You can drop both, and then you get the y, uh, um, the y provenance. But this still keeps non-minimal sets of, of witnesses. So if you just collapse to minimal sets of witnesses, I don't know where that disappeared. Ah, then you get this. Then you apply absorption, you, you get this positive um, Boolean expressions. Uh, and if you collapse everything together, then you get Widom's uh, lineages, just, just sets. OK, so I think that's, that's a picture that I wanted to show you um, about data provenance. I have this, uh, this slide, which I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't bl blow you away. Um, uh, somebody studied, one of the st students of, uh, of Val Tannen, uh, TJ Green, he studied uh, query containment. So we discuss query containment, right, for, for SQL queries. And uh, um, I hope you enjoyed that. It's kind of an insider knowledge uh, that not, not many people understand query containment uh, well. Uh, it turns out that, that query containment is, is a very interesting theoretical problem once you change uh, the, uh, the setting. Uh, for, for queries with set semantics, it's what we discussed. It's equivalent to exi existence of a homomorphism. But once you change that semantics, once you move to back semantics, uh, people know how to check equivalence. It's actually trivial. It, two queries are equivalent if and only if they are the same. They are isomorphic. But nobody knows how to check containment. Very bizarre. It's a major open problem. Nobody knows how, how to check containment. Uh, but what if instead of back semantics, you're using the semi-ring annotations? 
well, then containment starts to differ depending on the simulating that you use. Uh, and what TJ did, uh, TJ Green, uh, while student, he, he, he um, studied this containment, um, uh, this containment problem for all sorts of semi-rings. And uh, just to give you a flavor of the amount of effort that goes into such a research project, uh, he, he found that these containments, they are, they are kind of, they are interrelated in a complicated way depending on which semi-rings you pick, you pick. And this, is, this slide is a snapshot of all his results in that paper. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all I wanted to show you uh, about data provenance. A simple crisp abstraction, which is, if you know what the ring is, you drop half of it and you get a semi-ring, and this is what turns out to be needed to keep track of uh, where the data comes from. I think it's, it's, it's very nice. Any questions about provenance? Uh, are there any systems out here that keep data provenance? Do you know? In, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a, in a generic fashion. I'm pretty sure that many applications, they, they have their own implementations of, of provenance. Now you, you need to know where the data comes from. So probably, probably you have a field. If, if, if data in, tab in table R is copied from the data in table S, then you might have a field there which tells you where it, where it was copied from. Uh, but these ad hoc solutions, they don't, they don't extend to complicated queries. Uh, if you want a general solution, then you need, uh, you need same ring expressions. Okay, so um, I'm actually going quite fast. Um, the, the, the rest of this lecture, I have had actually even less information, less, less, but it's, it's about a very hard problem, and I don't want to show you details that I know don't work. This has been studied much more intensively than uh, provenance. It's a very old problem. Uh, it's about data security. And I will tell you what people uh, are doing today um, and on about data security. So um, the definition of data security is uh, that um, you, you, you want to protect the data from unauthorized uh, disclosure and modification. So uh, in, in a strict definition, it's, it's for, for both things. It's about disclosure and modification. So what does it mean? What does it mean that we want to protect the data from disclosure? So for example, on Facebook, right, you want to protect your, your pictures from people that uh, you didn't authorize to, to see. That's an example of protection. Uh, um, um, but if you, uh, if you take, uh, if, if you work for a company that has customers and you have access to the database of, of the customers, and now you want to give it to, to uh, a partner company for something, then you might want to protect certain information about your customers that you don't want to give out to your partner company. Uh, so that's, that's a kind of protection, of, of protection that we, we care, uh, care about. The modification is more subtle and it's actually less well studied. Uh, the modification goes like this. Suppose one day you go to Facebook and uh, you, you check there and your address, instead of being in Seattle, now it is in Honolulu. Did you modify it? No. So uh, the, the question is, do you have a proof? Can, can Facebook prove to you? that you were the one who modified it. That is, uh, that's called integrity. It's actually much more interesting if, uh, uh, if you hand out the data to somebody else. So suppose you, um, you prepare an important data set and now you, you distribute it. You give it to your friends, you give it to their friends and it eventually it reaches me and I trust you. But I don't trust all these intermediate people who, who got their hands on it. And now I, I would like to, to check that the data indeed comes from you and it hasn't been, uh, an advent, an advent, uh, it hasn't been modified by, by the intermediate, intermediaries. So this is integrity. It's much less studied. Uh, people uh, have studied much more the confiden confidentiality. How do you hide data? So let me, um, let me skip this. Um, I want to show you an, an attack. 
it is famous in this uh, research community. It's not as famous as in, in the real world. I think the AOL at attack is much more famous. Did you hear about the AOL attack? Uh, the, anom the anonymization one? Yeah. Okay, I, maybe I should mention that one uh, too, but let me, let me go through this attack first to give you a sense of what... Uh, uh, this was discovered by Latanya Sweeney uh, when she was a graduate student at um, MIT. Uh, now she is um, a professor at CMU. Uh, so in, in Massachusetts, where MIT is, uh, they have, for all state employees, they have uh, this group insurance commission uh, who buys uh, health insurance for the state employees. Uh, but it's a, it's a public institution, this uh, GIC. So they have to publish anonymized data about all, the, all, the, all their employees. So this was published back in 97, 98. I think it, it was already on the web. So it was anonymized because um, the, uh, all the names and social security numbers uh, they were, and, and address they were removed from the data. All that was kept was uh, this, uh, this anonymous zip, date of birth, sex, and then the, the, the medical data. So that, that, had, that had to be published by law, by law. Okay, so this is private because all the names had been removed. So what, what Latanya Sweeney did uh, back then, um, the, the voter registration information was not yet online because it belonged to a small county. Uh, but uh, she went and she could buy a floppy disk. It was a floppy disk actually that she bought for $20 with all the voter registration information uh, in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, a very rich uh, county. In, um, um, are people from the East Coast, from around Boston? Anybody from Boston here? Not many, but you probably know Cambridge, Massachusetts is a very rich um, um, county. Okay, so now she had voter information, and look, and you, you can actually get, you can get, even today, you can get voter information uh, with the name, party, and the address. This is public data. It has to be public. So guess what she did? She joins them. You can try to, is this, is this an exact join like we teach in databases? No, it's like shooting in the dark, but you know, you, you, don't, you don't need a perfect join. Or you need to, to find some interesting information, and this is what she, she found. Uh, she, uh, back then, the go governor, the governor of the, of the state of Massachusetts was William Weld. Uh, and therefore, see, he lived in this um, um, wealthy uh, county, uh, and he was a voter, right there, William Weld. Out of the, the people in that county, a six had the same date of birth as William Weld, which is not very surprising, right? Six, uh, there are 300 uh, days in a year time, six, 2,000, so probably there were like 2,000 uh, voters in, in, in that database. Half of them, not surprising, were men. I mean, statistics at, at work. Um, half of them were male. Uh, and how many do you think believed in, in that zip code as, as well? Only one. He was the only person in that zip code. So, for Governor William Welt, the combination of date of birth, sex, and zip uniquely identified him, which means that all the entries in the GIC database that had this, com that had this combination of date of birth, sex, and zip uniquely identified Governor Weld, and she could get it uh, to all, all his health records. And I need to tell you, unfortunately, she did not give us any spicy details in the research paper where she published this. Uh, she also only said that she could get access to his, uh, his health records. So this, I, I found this is a very surprising finding, right? Because if you think about system security, it's all about uh, viruses and attacks and denial of service. Uh, and the system, they are supposed to work perfect, but they always have these bugs, and uh, it's a never-ending patch, and um, you know, find new flaws, and uh, repatch, and uh, it seems to be a never-ending story. And we all blame Microsoft and Apple that they didn't, and even Unix has flaws. But here, there were no flaws. Everything worked as, as designed. 
it's just two pieces of data. They were all, both supposed to be published. Uh, so this, that's exactly the conundrum in, in, uh, um, in data privacy. How do we protect against such leakages? Uh, the other famous example is more recent, uh, and I need to discuss it. This was from um, <coughs> AOL query, query logs. So all these search engines, uh, they, they collect all the, log, all, all the queries. Uh, every click is collected, stored in their database. They have these huge databases of, of logs. And in AOL, they also have a user ID. Uh, I'm not sure how um, Google and Bing do it, but I'm pretty sure they have a way to identify users by IP address. They, they have all sorts of sophisticated uh, ways to, to try to, to identify uh, users across multiple uh, log entries. But in, uh, for AOL, it was trivial because um, everybody was logged in. So AOL had these uh, entries where there, had, there was a user ID and search term or search terms. Uh, and apparently it's very funny when you look at these logs, people search for all sorts of things. Uh, many people search for their uh, social security number. Okay, they want to see if their social security number is somewhere on the web. It's actually, it's a pretty clever search. But if you think about how people can use a log, right, they know exactly who asked that question because, well, <laughs> it's clear who asked that question. Uh, sometimes they ask very private um, information about, um, about uh, diseases or about um, uh, particular friends that are identified by, by their names or addresses, if you look up addresses. Um, okay, so what, what uh, AOL did, they replaced the user IDs with some random numbers, but they kept the linkage between the user IDs. So if, if you were user 55, AOL would randomize this, now you're 99, uh, but all your log entries, they are all identified by 99. That's a big mistake. Because now an attacker uh, can take these 99 records, and if in one of them you made a mistake and identified yourself, uh, then all the others are traceable back to you. So uh, this was broken, um, so this is query logs which AOL made public uh, for research purposes, uh, a very noble gesture uh, to make available data for researchers to do um, interesting research. Uh, but they thought it, su it suffices to anonymize the uh, uh, user IDs. Uh, and this was attacked, it was broken, not by researchers, but by two uh, um, New York Times reporters. So they spent time, they looked, looked at these query logs, and they found some searches uh, that uniquely identified uh, an old lady living, I don't remember, somewhere in the south, I think Georgia. Does anyone know where that lady lived? But she was looking for, she had some problems with her cats. Her, her cat mis was misbehaved. She, she searched some, some friends, some neighbors on the web. Um, so after, uh, but by correlating five or six such, such queries, the, the New York Times reporters, they were able to, um, to uniquely identify that woman uh, who was doing AOL searches. It was a huge scandal. So apparently, the, um, one of the, um, um, one person in the leadership of AOL lost his job. I think it, it was the CEO or the chief information officer, um, a, a very top person in AOL had to quit and to uh, resign over this scandal. Uh, and this is now cited everywhere, the fact that um, this was a major privacy, privacy breach. So what, what do we do with this? We want to publish data. Uh, even if you don't want to publish it, it might still be available somehow. Um, so how, uh, how, 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 how do we deal, deal with this? I'm going to show you two approaches that people are considering today. Uh, one is key anonymity. This was introduced by Latanya Sweeney as, as a solution for the attack that she discovered, uh, which is um, kind of useful. It is easy to, um, to see this work in practice, but it's not private. And the other one that uh, gained a lot of traction recently is a theoretical definition. Uh, which is elegant and simple. And I'm going to spend some time on, on trying to describe to you that definition, um, although I didn't prepare very good slides. 
This was introduced by Cynthia Dvork, uh, a theoretician, a very, um, very strong and, um, and uh, complex theoretician. She uh, works at Microsoft Research in, in the Silicon Valley, um, which is very uh, definitely private. It guarantees privacy, uh, but it's not useful in practice for reasons I'll, I'll describe. So let me start with key anonymity. So um, here is an example of a uh, database that is not private. But it's, it's, not, it's not a good choice for, for my example. Um, think about the zip, date of birth, and uh, gender combination that we had. There were, there were, those were three attributes. And the problem that we had in the, in the um, GIC uh, record was that these three uniquely identified um, the record of, of Dan World. So GIC made the mistake to release a, a piece of data where, where these three attributes that somebody could, could get from, from a different place uniquely identified a person, an, an, an entry, I, I should say. Uh, this is uh, the issue that I'm addressing here. Uh, but I use first name and last name, which is kind of silly because normally you would strip, strip them off. But uh, let's just imagine four attributes. And uh, uh, the, the problem is that all these four tuples are unique. So in key anonymization, what, what you would do, you would suppress some values or generalize them such that uh, um, every tuple becomes equal to k minus one other tuples. Uh, now, what is k? Uh, k is a parameter that you need to choose. Nobody tells you what. Uh, people who uh, took k anonymity very seriously, they recommend something like k equals 10, for example. So imagine trying to hide every tuple in a set of 10 tuples, and nobody can distinguish between these 10 tuples. So here is how it would work. So I, uh, I'm going to drop uh, the first name for what were these? Harry and Beatrice, and I'm going to replace this uh, with R star. I'm going to tell you, it starts with R, but I'm not going to tell you the last name. I'm going to generalize the age into an interval, and um, um, also the, I'm going to anonymize the, the race. So now this is two anonymous, k equals two here, because, because um, every tuple occurs twice. Okay, so if an attacker uses some other data set uh, where he knows the, 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 the owners of the, that data, he knows the, the, the people there, and tries to link to this anonymous data, then uh, well, he, he will be, the attacker will be confused up to a degree of k because every, every tuple is equal to k minus one other tuples. Okay, so um, in, in the database community um, where most people are engineers, uh, they quickly embrace this idea and they worked a lot on making it uh, and on, on, at implementing this very efficiently. But the problem is that it is not private. There are so many attacks, so many ways in which you can exploit the information that is still here to, uh, um, to infer um, very private information that, that's hidden in this, uh, in, in this, in this data. Um, I, don't have it, I don't have it here on this example, but I, I, I suppose you can, you can see the issue. Uh, it's not clear what the attacker can do, and the attacker can do a lot. The attacker can infer a lot even if you, if you do uh, key anonymization. And part of the reason is there is no mathematical guarantee to what exactly key anonymization hides. It's just a syntactic criteria. You check, you count the number of tuples. If there are k identical, you declare victory. But nothing tells you about what uh, information can lead to the attacker. OK, so here comes differential privacy introduced by uh, Cynthia Dvork. This is a mathematically rigorous definition. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, I'm going to, to, to finish this lecture around uh, um, 7.55 or so, so like in 15 minutes. But I, I do want you to, to give you a sense of differential privacy. 
because it's, it's a very um, it's a very good definition, uh, and it's, uh, I think it's a good opportunity for you to, to see it. Differential privacy says this. I have my database, and uh, I'm, I'm going to um, create an algorithm. The algorithm takes a database and returns an answer. I think of this answer as being a real number. Uh, maybe several near numbers. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, maybe the algorithm is the algorithm that allows me to compute um, some aggregate and group by. If it's an aggregate with a group by, then I get multiple real numbers in all the group bys. They're actually integers. Uh, maybe it's just a sum of some, some records, and then it's just one number. But the problem is, um, even if I just return this aggregate value, uh, there could still be privacy breaches. And Cynthia at work defined mathematically, in a, a mathematically rigorous way, what property does this algorithm, uh, must this algorithm have in order for it to be private. And here it is. Um, the algorithm, algorithm, first of all, is not deterministic, it's randomized. You're going to add some noise to, the, uh, to this output. So instead of returning a single number, it will return a distribution of, of uh, probabilities for, for numbers. Okay? So think about this. You're running, you're, you're running the, this, this query, and you might get 5, you might get 5.5, you might get 7, you might get 13, with different probabilities. If the real answer is 7, then probably you get more probability mass around 7. Here is differential privacy. It says, suppose you're adding one more tuple to the database. Uh, to the database, what am I doing here? So you're, you're co-opting co another user. You're, you're telling to that, to that other user, here is what will happen if you allow me to use your data. Then you, you run the same algorithm. You're not, you're not getting a single, the, the, the user is not getting a single number out of this algorithm. It's, getting, it's a probability distribution. The algorithm is differentially private if for, for any two such pairs of databases that differ in one tuple, uh, this probability distribution differs only a tiny bit. It differs actually by an amount epsilon. So let me write this rigorously because I didn't write it here. So it's differentially private, uh, it's epsilon differentially private if the probability that uh, the algorithm on D returns the value X by the probability that the algorithm on, uh, uh, on D where we inserted D returns the value X. This has to be almost like one. So it has to be between uh, e to the uh, epsilon and e to the minus epsilon. Okay? So let me read this a little bit. And this has to happen for every x. It's hard to digest, uh, but it, it actually sounds something quite, quite simple. So, um, so suppose I have a database of patients. And I want to uh, allow some users, some statisticians, to ask queries over this database of patients. Uh, like counting queries, they could count how many patients had, uh, um, um, have flu and live in this particular zip code. How many patients have, um, I don't know, stomachache and live in that zip code or have, are male or are whatever. They, they run these statistical queries. So I'm not going to give out the entire data. No, I'm just going to accept queries, compute them, add some noise. How much noise is not clear yet? Add some noise, uh, and then return answers. And now I'm going to go to a new patient and say, please allow me to use your, your data in this collection of, of, uh, uh, of data for which I'm, I have some users that are, are asking uh, these aggregate queries. Here is a promise I'm giving you. I'm giving you the promise that if the query returns uh, the value 17 with a, some probability today, then after you give me your data, 
if we return the value 17 with almost the same probability. Now the same query on the same data could also return 18 with some probability because it's not a deterministic algorithm, it's a randomized algorithm. But that's okay. If you give me the data, the same value 18 will be returned with almost the same probability. And the, the, the difference between these probabilities is actually not a difference, but it's a ratio. Uh, it's again controlled by a parameter, by epsilon. And it is um, um, between 1 by e to the epsilon and e to the epsilon. So what happens if I choose epsilon equals to 0? What is a differentially private algorithm for epsilon equals to 0? Those statisticians which are serving with the algorithm, what will they observe about the answer that you're returning on, your, on the data set? What are these numbers on the left and right? They're 1. Hmm. So what, what does this algorithm uh, do? It might return 17 with some probability on this database. Now if you add a tuple, just a single tuple, it will return 17 with what probability? Exactly the same. Now if I add 1,000 more tuples, what will it do? Exactly the same. So you can get this perfect privacy only if your algorithm doesn't even look at the data. It doesn't it completely ignores it. So this gives you a sense of what differential privacy tries to achieve. It tells you that as you, as you uh, so epsilon is greater than zero, but it's probably close to zero. Uh, it says that as you uh, add or remove one tuple at a time, the, the, the users of this database they will not observe uh, too much change in, in, in uh, the, the stat statistics. But at the same time, it can be very useful for, for statisticians. If they look for uh, uh, ep an epidemic of flu and they ask um, how many patients have flu per zip code, group by zip code, then they can narrow down. I mean, they will still get numbers with some noise. Uh, but if these numbers are in the range of, of thousands, then uh, a tiny amount of noise will not, will not affect uh, too much the results, and it's still differentially private. So that, that is the appeal. The major, uh, the major difficulty with differential privacy, and actually instead of showing you the slide, let me explain this right here, is in, in the setting. It only works for, for one query. Now if you return, uh, instead of a single number, if you return like, uh, 200 numbers, you do a group by zip code. It also applies, but then it's, it applies to 200 queries. But what you cannot allow, you cannot allow users to ask queries forever. And there is actually a theorem which says that if you allow users to ask queries forever, then it's either or. Either a, a, a hacker will eventually get to, uh, to some private information in your database, or you must inject so much noise that nobody can use, can use these queries for anything useful. Uh, so this is a major, major um, shortcoming of, of differential privacy. It does not, um, 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 it, it needs to impose a limitation on the number of queries. Um, so they figured out how to do this in a smooth uh, fashion. You get a privacy budget uh, as if, if you're a user, then you get a privacy budget, and then you, you can use it. You can say, I want a, a, a better answer to this query, and then you're using more of your budget, and then I want a more approximate answer to the next query, and you're using a tiny bit of the remaining budget. But once your budget, ex budget expires, then uh, they don't know what to do. Then, uh, then you're in, in a dead end, because the, the theory says that from now on the data could be compromised and they, they don't know what to, what to do with that. Okay, so um, uh, just one last thought about privacy because it's something you hear a lot. And um, uh, let me just tell you that m most people, uh, including myself and including many of my colleagues in the community, we confuse privacy with confidentiality. 
what I showed you so far was confidentiality, was uh, this desire to hide private information. But in reality, private, privacy is something much more difficult to capture and to uh, manage, uh, which is the ability of the users to control how their private data is being used. So it's not about hiding, but it's about the user's control over, um, uh, over, over their data. Uh, and currently, people don't know, don't know how to handle this in a, in a, um, in a generic way, how to address privacy. OK, any questions? I, I know I, I went very quickly over this, but I wanted to give you a feel of privacy. Any questions about privacy or confidentiality? Because, well, uh, I got to my very last slide. Uh, so what can I tell you at the end of uh, uh, a nice quarter? First of all, I really enjoyed uh, talking in front of, uh, of you both uh, live and uh, through the wonders of technology. Um, so I hope that you, you got lots of lessons out of this course. The data management is, uh, is, is so rich. It has a variety of topics. There, are, there is the old traditional um, topic of uh, data modeling, conceptual design that we need to know, uh, asset properties. Uh, then there is a lot of emphasis on performance. How do we take uh, the, the um, logical design and map it into, a, into a, an, an efficient query, query plan. Uh, a lot of, lot of emphasis on performance, and today um, per performance can mean performance in parallel systems. Um, it can mean performance on, on multiprocessors, uh, performance in, in many settings. Uh, but um, it's not just that. There are all sorts of other aspects of data management that are not, not related to performance, like provenance. Right? People want to keep track of their data. What does it mean? Instead of hacking some, some ad hoc um, um, provenance approach, there is this beautiful uh, theory of semi-rings that allows you to uh, think about provenance. Um, and and, the, and um, data privacy. The, the problem with data privacy is that, well, now we have a nice definition but we don't have a good solution to data privacy in general. OK, and on this note, I think I'll stop here. Um, and I know some of you are busy with homework 7, which is going to be done in a, couple, in a few hours. Uh, and after that, uh, you're waiting for me for the final um, grade, uh, which I, I promise myself I'm going to send to you as soon as I can grade the last uh, uh, remaining finals. So probably uh, on Friday. I hope you'll get your, you'll get your final grade on Friday. Good. So it was a pleasure um, teaching you this quarter. And have a, um, have, have a great um, holidays and um, a good, uh, um, well, a good experience in the rest of the program.